Hey, welcome, welcome, good evening. Wow, it's great to see so many people here. This is wonderful. Um, I'm Susan Walrose. I am a member of the law faculty at UD, and I'm also chair of the speaker series committee. Um, and on behalf of the University of Dayton and the speaker series committee, I would be very happy to welcome all of you to our first event for the fall season. I would love to extend a special welcome also to the students who are here and especially the law students who are here. Um, and as well, any of you who are coming from the, the uh, greater Dayton community from outside campus. And I hope you'll consider returning to attend additional events later in the fall. We're delighted to have Will Haygood and uh, Michael Carter also here tonight with us. But before we begin, I'd just like to announce the two uh, remaining events that we'll have uh, this fall for our series. On Monday, October 15th at 7 here, we're going to have uh, Richard Reeves. He's a fellow at the Brookings Institute. And he's the author of the book Dream Hoarders, How the American Upper Middle Class is Leaving Everyone Else in the Dust why that is a problem, and what to do about it. And on Wednesday, November 17th, we will be joined by Maz Jabrani. He's an Iranian-American comedian, and you may know him from his very popular TED Talks, and also for NPR listeners, his regular appearances as a panelist on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And again, we hope you will consider returning to attend both of those events. So at this time, I would like to ask you to silence your cell phones or whatever else you have that might make some technical noise. And I would like to introduce and thank Tiffany Taylor Smith for organizing this event, um, arranging with Will Haygood. She is the Executive Director for Inclusive Excellence Education and Professional Development here at UD, and she will be introducing Will Haygood. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I brought these just in case, so I'm not sure if I'm going to need to put them on, but we'll see. I want to also acknowledge my partner in this adventure, Miss Andrea Wade. Without her, I could not have delivered this event. <laughs> Wade, do you know me? <laughs> okay, it does look better with this. Okay. <laughs> I want to welcome you again to the University of Dayton and to this special evening. Um, we are honored this evening to not only have Will Hager join us um, as we were exploring. Then when I look at you all, you look really big, so that's not going to work. Okay, so we, um, in conversations, brought together a group of folks to plan this evening. And actually, I would love it. There are a couple folks who may be in the room. If you could just stand, if you were worked on the the unofficial group committee to plan this evening. Could you just stand up? I know some of you are here. Yes. <laughs> By no means was this the one woman show, so thank you for your efforts and thank you all for coming. We are um, honored this evening to have an, a conversation uh, with Will Haygood that will be facilitated by a special guest, Michael Carter, who is the Chief Diversity Officer at Sinclair Community College. And I will have the pleasure of introducing Mr. Will Haygood. He is currently a visiting distinguished professor in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film at Miami University in Ohio. For nearly three decades, he was a journalist serving as a national and foreign correspondent at the Boston Globe, where he was a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and then at the Washington Post. He is the author, author of the book, which became a film, The Butler, A Witness to History, Showdown, Thurgood Marshall and the Supreme Court nomination that changed America, Sweet Thunder, The Life and Times of Sugar Ray Robinson, in Black and White, The Life of Sammy Davis Jr., Two on the River, King of Cats, The Life and Times of Adam Clayton Powell, and The Hagids of Columbus, a family memoir. The Butler was later adapted into a critically acclaimed film directed by Lee Daniels, starring Forrest Whitaker and Oprah Winfrey. He has received a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, 
and the 2017 Patrick Henry Fellowship Literary Award for his research on Tigerland. He lives in Washington, D.C. and spends a lot of time in the state of Ohio. A native of Columbus, Ohio, please join me in welcoming Will Haygood. Before they come to the stage, there is a brief video that we want to share with you. Well, it's called Tigerland. It's a book about a group of local high school athletes who made history at a time of great turmoil in America. I recently sat down with the author and two of the stars he wrote about to get a sense of that season for the ages. History made in 1969 at St. John Arena. The Columbus East High School Tigers claim a resounding 71-56 victory over the Canton McKinley Bulldogs in the state basketball championship. Add to that a state baseball championship in the same year, something no school had ever done before. It's just a great story with drama, the 1960s, great athletes, guys who were my heroes. Prize-winning author and Columbus native Will Haygood calls Tigerland a book he just had to write about black teens from an inner city school who looked beyond the civil rights upheaval that gripped the nation back then to demonstrate excellence in sports. There was so much pain around the country in, in the city that to see a unit, an athletic unit together and see them relentlessly winning week after week after week, that was your victory against America right there. Basketball star Dwight Bo Pete Lamar on the left and baseball phenom Ernie Locke remember those days like yesterday. We never hung our heads down. We knew we had uh, we had a job to do. We, everybody was razor focused, and uh, we knew we had a job to do. And that was going there and win that game. They did it in an era when there were riots in the street over the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy, and when people protested against the Vietnam War. Basketball and sports always had a way of bringing people together not separating them. And that's just what they did, cutting down the net of racial prejudice and in the process, becoming ambassadors for peace in a story that hadn't been told till now. If you ask me, Tigerland, this book, is literary justice. So in the summer of 1968, little Will Haygood's family moves from the integrated north side of Columbus, Ohio to the segregated east side. His early vivid memories were of seeing the barrel of tanks pointed at him. Soldiers had taken control of this neighborhood because of the anger and the aftermath of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. It was a scary time to be a boy, a little black 13-year-old boy. There were gunshots in the night. And the tanks seemed to always be rumbling. You needed a note from your mother just to walk to the store. That was no way for a 13-year-old boy to come of age in this nation. But that's what time it was in America. And then something happened. 
It was like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. Everything started to swirl. And when little Will Haygood woke up, he realized he was in Tigerland. He would go to the playground and see Roy Hickman on the basketball pavement. And he was practicing and practicing. And he said to little Will Haygood, yes, you can play. That fall and winter, nothing, nothing gave that 13-year-old boy more joy than to go to the fairgrounds coliseum and watch the golden boy of that golden year, Ed Ratliff. And while Will Haygood lived on the integrated side of the north side of the city, he knew the family of Dwight Beaupeet Lamar. And he almost cried when he heard that his neighborhood hero had been kicked off of the team at North High School by his coach because he refused to cut his afro. So it just so happens that Will Hager's family moved to the east side when Dwight Bo Pete Lamar moved to the east side. And to see him play for all black East High School was a genuine revelation. And to hear of this great baseball team. And that was the sport that America did not want blacks to play. It took Jackie Robinson to integrate baseball. Baseball was apple pie. It wasn't black kids. And yet these kids gave something to little Will Haygood. It was a sense of greatness in discipline, in focus. Two state championships in the same year, the year that Martin Luther King Jr. went down and the year that Bobby Kennedy went down. How they kept that focus is astonishing. We don't need anybody in the White House telling us who can make America great again. These guys help make America great. And they had so many people at their back. Medgar Evers, Rosa Parks, Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, Jackie Robinson. It is a quintessential American story. And if there had have been justice at the time, they would have been on a box of Wheaties. But they were not. This book happens to be dedicated to four people. Phyllis Callahan, who was the provost at my alma mater, Miami University. Bob Hart, who was the basketball coach. And on his deathbed, he said, 
I'm hurt because I'm not in the Hall of Fame, in the high school Hall of Fame. He said, I think it's because I coached only black kids. And those who vote simply won't give me my respect. Bob Hart landed at Normandy in World War II. He was stricken by what he saw in the treatment of black soldiers. And he wrote his senior thesis on the unfair treatment of the black soldier in World War II. So he belonged at East High School. That's where he wanted to be. Several years after he died, he was finally inducted into the Hall of Fame. I say to Bob Hart today that there is justice because his name appears on the dedication page of this book. Thank you for coming. Thank you for caring about this story. I think little boys and girls, no matter their race, no matter rich or poor, any place in this country, will find triumph in this story. And we are in a season right now in this country where we can use a story of inspiration. And with that, I'd like to bring my dear friend, Michael Carter, to the stage. Dade knows how to bring out a crowd, don't they? This is wonderful. You know, we've had a lot of conversations about this book. In fact, probably the first conversation, you wouldn't even tell me fully what you were working on, but you said, I've got an idea that you're going to love. Uh, this was a couple years ago when we were driving. Um, we had gone to, uh, I guess the back story is, Will came to speak here in Dayton couple years ago, and on the way back, he said he was hungry, wanted to get something to eat. He said, what's the deal with this Milano's? I want to go to Milano's. So we went to Milano's, and on our way back, he let me know that he had this idea, and, and this book, this wonderful book, was what <clears throat> you were working on. Yep, yep. So let me start off by asking you, you've written many books. Tiffany mentioned several of them, The Butler, Showdown, uh, et cetera. Why Tigerland and why at this time? Um, it was sort of like The Butler in as much um, I like to swerve here a bit because somebody out in the hallway asked me uh, my, my most vivid memory of making that movie, The Butler, you know, uh, and as I was walking in here, I started to think about it. And I guess my most vivid memory is, uh, after it won all of those awards and made more than $100 million at the box office, I heard from both of the ladies who turned me down for the high school prom. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's that about? <laughs> One of them said, now surely, Will, you aren't holding a grudge, baby. And I said, now, sweetie, why would I hold a grudge about what happened on May 18th <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> outside of Miss Johnson's homeroom class when I begged you to go to the prom with me? But all that's in the past, so let me get back. <laughs> let me get back to this. I 
saw this story out there, floating, floating in the water, you might say. And nobody was interested in pulling the story to shore. And I wanted to go out there and get it, bring it to shore and see what it was all about. And it just seemed a wonderful story to tell. This is a sports mad nation. Um, and this is not really a sports story, but it is. Sports gets us into the door of the story. Um, and it just seemed like a wonderful story to tell. I mean, look, it's hard enough to win one state championship. It, you know, it really is. And you win two in the same year. That's really pretty special. Uh, and these were some special guys, special cats, had a whole lot of character about them. Eight of the 12 basketball players, mothers worked as maids on their hands and knees scrubbing people's bathtubs so that their sons could eat and have decent clothes at school. And so it just seemed like a wonderful story to tell. And then uh, we start hearing all these stories about race in America. And Charlottesville happens. Athletes are pilloried from the White House. Athletes who care about social justice. Uh, and so 50 years on, some of the same issues that were in the news in 68 are in the news now. And so for some sad reasons, I think the book seems very timely. Okay. So my wife and I were having a conversation about the book. She saw that I've got this book and I can't put it down. Um, but you see the cover, and it, it's on the cover. It's obviously a sports book. But when we were talking, I really, sports are the backstory of what you're trying to convey. But also, you know, we're you got a dating crowd. Talk about why this book will resonate with people, whether they're sports fans or not, whether they live in Columbus or not. Uh, there's even, I'll give a little teaser, there's some strong dating connections. Uh, you even, we talked backstage about the, you know, you, a little mention of our beloved uh, Judge Walter Rice yep. is in the book. So why would people outside of Columbus be interested in this story? The same reason that you couldn't put it down. It's well written, it's beautifully written. <laughs> Beautifully reported. <laughs> no, I think that this, you know, it's one of those stories like, in like Friday Night Lights or like Hoosiers, uh, I think stories that have a lot of teachable moments in them. And, um, um, and we love the underdog in this country. We do. And these are underdogs. I mean, these, I mean, they really are. I mean, um, you know, uh, they were living in a segregated community. Uh, the school was too crowded. There were 1,000, almost 1,300 students. It was too crowded. The city wouldn't build another high school for them. Um, uh, the whole area was very poor. Um, uh, and yet they, they kept winning. They kept winning. And you know, there's just something very beautiful about that. Um, It's just a special story 
when you go deep. It's an epic story in its own way, but it's also intimate. Um, and these mothers who were maids uh, had to find a way to make it. The athlete who's on the, who's on the, who's on the front cover of this book, Mr. Dwight Lamar, uh, his mother was a maid, and she suffered migraines terribly. And when he was kicked off his team because of his big afro, he went home and he asked his mother, what should he do? His dream was being snatched from him. So all he wanted to do was just play basketball and have a shot to go to college. All of these athletes were first generation college hopefuls, every single one of them. And uh, his mother, who came out of Georgia, looked at him and said, I did not leave the South for you to lose your dignity. So you can keep your Afro. But she knew that meant that he was off the team. And it just so happens that Jack Gibbs, who was the African-American principal, ran into him and said, well, I know you live in a whole nother part of town, but my goodness, if you ever moved geographically over to the east side where there's only one high school, we would welcome you and your Afro with open arms. And, and so Mrs. Lamar had a family relative who lived on the east side and they helped her find a low income place to live and so they moved. But look at that, that's one black kid who if he didn't have this, this black man looking out for him, his life might have gone wayward. I mean, you know, and he was very close, of course, to getting a scholarship. Right. You know, he had led the city league in scoring when, uh, when uh, he was a junior. But pride is a deep thing. Pride, pride, pride takes armies across oceans. Pride is a deep thing. He was, you know, his mother, no, 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 no. We stop right here. This is where we draw the line in the sand. Black is beautiful. If you can't be beautiful, then in your own skin, uh, then so be it. And for that mother to have that vision. Yes, yeah. and that strength of character. For a mother to have that character is, to me, uh, it's just awesome. So you mentioned Jack Gibbs. Let's talk a little bit about Jack Gibbs. And Jack Gibbs was the first black principal in the city of Columbus, uh, vouched for by his college football coach, Woody Hayes. Woody Hayes called and said, you need to hire Jack Gibbs. But uh, He had been passed over twice. Right. And more qualified white than anyone yeah. uh, he was competing for a job with. Uh, he was beloved, loved by his students. I would call Jack Gibbs a secondary hero in the book. And give us a peek into Jack Gibbs. Uh, um, if he's your secondary hero, who's the first? <laughs> the moms, for me? Yeah. Okay, well, the moms. The, okay. the moms and, okay. and, of course, these players who were my heroes growing up. My brother would come home and talk about these guys. And, of course, the state tournament, none of the games are televised until the state tournament. You're watching these players play. Okay. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Jack Gibbs, a phenomenal character. Uh, when I was talking to his widow, Miss Gibbs, Jack Gibbs died. Uh, young, he was just 55. It, it was, it was just tragic. Um, he worked himself to death. But after I finished talking to his kids and his wife, 
I said to myself that I have to go to Harlan, Kentucky, where he was born and raised. I, I, I had heard something said by uh, his widow, and I stood up as I was leaving, and I said, well, Mrs. Gibbs, you know, this is what I do, and I'm going to Harlan, Kentucky, so I can research your husband's life. And she said, well, we all want to go, too. <laughs> She's 90 years old, but two weeks later, I found myself rumbling down a highway with Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Gibbs and, and Jack Gibbs, Jr., who's a lawyer, and Cheryl Gibbs, uh, her daughter. Um, and this is what I often tell my students. As a journalist, it's all about shoe leather. Uh, I've never found a great story by making phone calls. You have to go knock on doors. So I went to Harlan, Kentucky, and I'm riding around town. And Jack Gibbs, the son, says to me, uh, uh, Mom, I think we ought to visit, visit the cemetery. And I said, who are you going to visit at the cemetery? Mr. Gibbs is buried in Columbus. And, and he said, oh, 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 Will, my dad had a sister uh, who died in infancy and here in Harlan, whooping cough, whooping cough. And um, uh, Jack Gibbs would have to walk with his mother every Sunday when he was a kid to the top of a, top of a hill of this segregated cemetery and watch his mother kneel and cry at the gravesite of her infant daughter. And it clicked in me. It clicked right there. Jack Gibbs had to leave town and go to Columbus when he was 14 years old. He left his little sister on top of the hill. He left her on top of the hill. And as a writer, there was a thread right there. There was a thread. Jack Gibbs was not going to leave the white Bo Pete Lamar behind on the hill of this white high school on the north side. He wasn't going to allow it to happen. And so he committed his life to rescuing kids so, so that they wouldn't suffer the death of a dream. Really quickly, another cool thing that Jack gives it, mention what he did after they won the state basketball championship, what did they do after the game? There was a concert in downtown Columbus. Jack Gibbs had a student, a student named Kurt Bishop, and he asked Kurt if he could make some phone calls downtown because the person who was on stage downtown was James Brown. So can you believe that? On the night that they win the state basketball championship, James Brown is on stage. And they call James Brown when they get to the door and they explain to him, Mr. Brown, it's this team, East High School. They just won the state championship. And it was so funny to hear some of the players explain to me what happened. Uh, he said, oh, I love sports. Oh, I want them to come on in. I want them to come on in here and be with me. And uh, uh, he really didn't know how big it was to have won this very tough, tough game against the school. And uh, he looked at the players, and he looked out over the audience, and he just said two words. He just sounded like you know he was still down south. He said, they champions. <laughs>
they champions. Not they are champions, they, but they, cha they champions. It was just beautiful. And one of the players said that, one of the small players on East High School's team, Larry Walker, he was like 5'7", he said, I looked down at James Brown and he had lifts in his shoes. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Yeah. So you mentioned Bob Hart. Um, so two white coaches, Bob Hart, the basketball coach, Paul Pinnell, the baseball coach, and assistant basketball coach were remarkable men well ahead of their time. Uh, in fact, you mentioned the college paper Hart wrote in 1946. Um, I'm gonna read a piece of that and then let you comment mm -hmm. about uh, Bob Hart and, and, and that influence. I'm convinced, this is February 18, 1946. I'm, com I'm convinced that the Negro has possibilities for development equal to anything we whites have. I'm convinced that if given the chance, the whole Negro race can become one of our greatest assets. To do anything to deprive them of this possibility is to deprive the world of some of its greatest culture. I am convinced that the only answer to the race problem and the only hope for an undivided America, the only possible program from a cultural viewpoint is equal rights for black and white and the opening up of our institutions to the development of the Negro. He wrote this in 46. 1946, that's where his head was at. I mean, it's, it's just astonishing. Now, I visited Bob Hart's daughter uh, in her home. And at the end of my interview, uh, she said, Will, there's something I have to show you. You've been asking me a whole lot of questions about dad and what drove dad. So she went down her basement and brought up this big sack and she pulled out something and she said, when my dad, when he got out of college, uh, I mean, when he got out of the war, he went back to college and he wrote this. And I said, well, what is it? And she said, it's his senior thesis. Look at it. And I started reading and I said, oh my God, this is like, you know, that's why I like to go out in the middle of the ocean, so to say, and find a story and simply drag it back to land. And, you know, that was a key part of mm. his character, you know, a key part of his character. And my goodness, it was great that his, his daughter thought, you know, to to share that paper with me. And Paul Pinnell's a remarkable man. In fact, talk about six degrees of separation. So a couple years ago, I go to the state basketball tournament, and I see Tony Thomas, who's superintendent of Northmont Schools. And I'm talking to Tony, he said, I want you to uh, meet my mentor and coach, Paul Pinnell, who coached oh, wow. him as, as well. But Paul Pinnell, whose, whose wife would oftentimes be the only uh, baseball games. Talk right. a little bit about that. Yeah. She'd be the only person oftentimes at games. Sharon Pinnell, who was just uh, so helpful to me in writing this book. Uh, uh, Paul Pinnell grew up in the 40s, and there was one rule, he's white, and, and there was one rule, he said, in, in his, his home. And, his dad said, everybody else in the neighborhood is doing it, but you are not allowed to ever do it in this house. And it was utter a racial slur. He, he said, his dad, that was one cardinal rule that his father had. There will be no racial slurs under this roof. And um, uh, I was with his wife. Uh, she was on her sick bed, um, and she was laughing in her sick bed, in her bedroom, just laughing, laughing. And her husband and me, we were talking, Coach Pinnell, out in the living room talking. 
And his wife was just laughing up a storm, and he said, man, let me go in here and see who she's talking to. And she went in there, he went in there, and he came back, and he said, oh, man, she's talking to Eddie Ratliff. You know, one of the five players who was just calling from California to check on Mrs. Pinnell. And uh, she just passed away six months ago. Mm. And uh, uh, she loved those kids, yeah. those players. She just, she just loved them. And it was just a lovely, lovely story. Their baseball team, they suffered a five-game losing streak. Nobody, I mean, and they lost in the city league tournament, but with the baseball tournament in the state championship, all teams get invited. And so East reaches the state tournament, and they go on a tear after winning, I mean, after losing those five games during the season, they go on a tear and win eight straight tournament games. And there was a the team they played, East Liverpool, for the championship game, East Liverpool had a, uh, had a deep-pocketed booster in town, booster. He owned a uh, funeral home. And so he said, man, we aren't going down to Columbus in no rickety bus. He said, we're going in three hearse, hearse cars, hearses, <laughs> hearse. He said, we getting in those hearses in style, and we going down to Columbus, and we're going to kick butt. And, and they had beautiful uniforms, East Liverpool. Uh, all the starting team had scholarships to big schools, Penn State and Michigan. They were muscular cats. And they looked at East, and some of the players had uniforms that were too small, didn't have new cleats or nothing. And they just thought that they were going to wipe East off the face of the earth. And, and they got beat. They got beat. Uh, and East hoisted the state championship. East Liverpool went back home in their hearses. <laughs> and as I told someone, their battle against East High was the death of them. <laughs> oh. So you, you mentioned that. So you've got a team, Mitch Match uniforms, really no f field with no dugout. No dugout. You know, raggedy field, no baseball pedigree. You know, baseball is a sport where you're typically successful because you have pedigree. Your, your team has invested uh, in baseball. Uh, how did they win it? And, you know, and I, as I read this, I'm thinking, man, Will's got another movie on it. it this, is a, this is a baseball version of Hoosiers for the baseball team. Yeah. So how, how did that happen? They didn't win the city, five-game losing streak. Um, weren't really respected. Oh, you you, you gotta go to that, that page. No, uh, no, uh, something else. Um, when I was writing this book, uh, and I had to transition after the first half of the book when they win their first state championship in basketball. <clears throat> and I had to figure out how I was going to go into the second half of the book. Uh, and I needed a story to start it. Uh, and, and I was talking to my editor. And I told him, and I said, if I go directly from basketball straight to baseball, it's going to seem like too much of a sports book. So I wanted to slow the narrative down and write something that was interesting. And these black players on the baseball team were coached in this little league team in Columbus by three men, by three black men. Uh, and these three black men had seen, had seen Jackie Robinson play. And they would talk to these guys who were like 
8, 9, 10, who would grow up to become East High School's ragtag baseball team. And so uh, then I had it. I said, oh, I got it. I got it. I'm going to write uh, like a tight chapter, and I'm going to call it The Ballad of Jackie Robinson. And here's how that, here's how that chapter opens now. And now keep in mind, eight of the 12 basketball players' mothers were maids. Five of the baseball, starting nine, five of the baseball players' mothers were maids. So keep that at the front of your memory bank as I read this opening graph in the chapter that takes you to the second half of the book. That's all about baseball. Before he was a bellwether for race in America, before he was an icon who claimed national and international headlines, before he sent angry whites, popcorn kernels, and spittle flying from their mouths into spasms inside all those lovely old ballparks around the country, before he snatched the throne as the most inspiring black athlete of his era by integrating professional baseball, before all the magazine articles and essays and books were written about him, Jackie Robinson was just a black kid with a glove, a bat, and a mom who worked as a maid. You know how to weave it, don't you? <laughs> So I wanted to follow that up and read the page of the players getting ready 325. to 325. 325. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is the uh, uh, early afternoon when the East High Tigers baseball team is getting ready to go to the state championship. And um, uh, and I wanted to, to write a scene and have somebody read it in Hollywood and say to themselves, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to make a movie out of this. <laughs> I wrote that scene for that man or woman, wherever they're at, out in Hollywood. And here's the scene. It's, a, it's, it's the scene uh, with the players getting ready to go and meet their destiny. Here goes. In the early afternoon of May 30, the Tiger baseball players gathered their belongings inside their homes and their apartments in the low-income housing projects. The night before, some of their mothers had washed their uniforms by hand. Some of the players had washed their uniforms themselves. They still had mismatched belts and worn down cleats. Leroy Crozier came out the door at 1152 East Rich Street. Garnett Davis from 1629 Oak Street. Robert Cathrell from 421 Chatfield Avenue. Ernie Locke out the door at 980 Caldwell Place, apartment 21. Phil Mackey said goodbye to his mother at 1447 Fair Avenue. Larry Mann emerged from 1586 Tiffin. Kenny Mizell exited, exited from 980 Caldwell Place, apartment 24. Roger Neighbors stepped into the daylight from 453 Eldridge. 
Nora Smith from 216 North Garfield, Richard Twitty from 309 Linwood, Harry Williams from 2483 Brockton Court, Ray Scott from 364 North Garfield, Tony Brown from 1200 Author Place, Eddie Ratliff, emerged from 1201 Bride and Road, passing an alcoholic stepfather who was already mumbling nonsense. In every one of their homes, either on a wall or atop a mantelpiece, sat the visage of Martin Luther King Jr. Day at 13 months now, they were tigers. And they didn't just have an appointment on the north side of the city, they had a dream. They were going to meet a group of baseball players who aimed to stop their journey. And they were intent on not letting that happen. Oh, somebody can't read that and not make a movie. Hollywood has lost its way. <laughs> that is tremendous. I think we have t uh, time for one more question. I want to ask you this. We've talked about this quite a bit. Um, we often see civil rights as a Southern issue, but in the book you laid Columbus racial issues bare during the 1960s. Talk about why it was important to do that. Um, I, I really think it shows the high wall in that these players uh, had to climb. They had a, a school that didn't have enough resources. And they had a city uh, that had done a lot of things to keep the neighborhood segregated and the school system underfunded on their side of town. And I think if you are going to write a story about a city in a team, you really need to write about the landscape around it too, and some of those those characters. Um, and so it was it was really crucial to me uh, to talk about people like Judge Robert Duncan. Judge Robert Duncan went to OSU. He got out of he got out of college. He wanted to be a school teacher. In Columbus, they sent all blacks to either Champion Junior High or East High School. When he went there, uh, there were no openings, so he couldn't get a job that year. It was 1954. Uh, he decided to go to law school. He went to law school, finished, uh, and uh, he works various jobs in the city. Uh, he becomes a judge. And uh, when things are falling apart in the White House, William Saxby, who was working in the Nixon White House, and convinces the Nixon White House to appoint Robert Duncan, a federal judge. Robert Duncan takes his, his place on the bench, becoming the first federal judge in that part of the state. Uh, and uh, after East wins these two championships, black parents and NAAC members, NAACP members start asking this question, why is East still segregated? Why doesn't East have enough money? Why are the resources over here so limited? They had been emboldened and lifted up by what these, uh, these boys had done. You know, they had an extra, extra muscle, it seemed like, to them. So they decided to sue the city school system. They said, this doesn't do. This is not right. Thurgood Marshall fought and won in the 1954 case. Schools should be desegregated. And so... Uh, they launched a lawsuit, and uh, as history would have it, uh, that lawsuit 
uh, lands on the desk of a certain federal judge. That federal judge, Robert Duncan. And he assured people, don't have to worry about me. I'm going to be fair. I'm going to be as fair as this case warrants it. And he took four months to read over that case. And I'll tell you what he said. Here we go. <clears throat> On March 8th, 1977, Judge Robert Duncan issued his decision. In tones both measured and direct, he ruled for the plaintiffs, agreeing to their charge that the Columbus public school system was not only segregated, but that city leaders had knowingly perpetuated the situation. Quote, as I understand their argument, Judge Duncan wrote of the school board, quote, they claimed that they would have investigated had Columbus school officials so requested. This position borders on the preposterous. It cannot be reasonably be expected that those who violate the Constitution will be anxious for an investigation in order that a remedy may be leveled against them, end quote. In another part of the ruling, Duncan hearkened to the Brown v. Board decision, quote, the Brown principle is still quite valid today, he wrote that unlawfully segregated schools are inherently unequal because black children are expected and required to grow up, live and work in a majority white society. It is not only unlawful, it is unfair for public officials by their actions or their inaction to promote with segregative intent racially imbalanced schools. Duncan, who had known great black educators like Jack Gibbs, who might have become a school teacher himself, who had felt the sting of racism in the city, left little doubt that he knew how much this case meant to the plaintiffs. Quote, the evidence in this case harkens back to a previous era in the history of Columbus, a time fresh in the memory of some who testified at trial when black parents and their children were openly and without pretense denied equality before the law and before their fellow citizens. I was just in my hometown for five days, and there were some book events. Uh, and I was being called the favorite son of the city. I wonder if city officials are still going to think that when they get to page 350 in the book. <laughs> we shall see. Will, thanks for writing this wonderful book. Thanks for allowing me to share this space with you. Thanks for coming to Dayton. It's wonderful. Thank you. Oh, don't get off the stage yet. Wait a second. What I'd like to do, what we would like to do is open up for just a couple of questions before he moves to his book signing. So there are several microphones placed throughout the room. So if anyone um, has a question that you'd like to take this opportunity to ask Mr. Hager, please step to the microphone. I know you're trying to get it. Thank you. 
Sharon Grotto, professor of music here at the University of Dayton. I'm not a historian at all. I have one quick comment and one question. Uh, my comment is that I've been having recently a very unique experience, at least for me, because I've been reading the Thurgood Marshall book at the same time these hearings are going on in DC. Oh. Yeah. That's all I have to say. Yeah. Uh, my question is this. Uh, historians are supposed to tell stories, and all historians, unfortunately, are not storytellers. My experience with history classes in my lifetime, I could count on one hand which ones were taught by storytellers. What is your inspiration for being such a great storyteller? Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I, I tend to write books that I would like to read. Um, and so um, I wish that this book had a, I mean, a small part of me, wish that I could have read a book like this, uh, Tigerland, but if I wanted it to exist, I was going to have to write it. It's just like Thurgood Marshall's Supreme Court hearings. Uh, they stretched over two weeks, five days worth of hearings. Never before in the history of Supreme Court hearings had hearings before him lasted more than six hours. And so why do they stretch Thurgood Marshall's hearings out over two weeks, and we all know why. And, and I wanted to tell the stories behind that book and behind, I mean, behind those hearings. I just thought if I could tell it the way I like to write and the angles that I like to take in stories, then I thought maybe the book might find readers, might find an audience. Uh, so that's why. So. Any other questions? I, I have one. Uh, I'm sort of wondering, you talked about the importance of character, but I was also, while I was watching you, thinking about uh, your sense of ambition how important that is for people. So I, I wondered where or who instilled in you your sense of ambition? Um, gee whiz. <clears throat> Here's the only way that I think I can answer that. Um, when I was in the eighth grade, and I went out for the basketball team and I was cut. I was cut. I didn't see my picture. I mean, in my name on the wall, you know, the, the sheet that hung on the wall, and I was cut. And I went to the head coach and I said, sir, I think you made a mistake. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, excuse me? And I said, coach, I think you made a mistake. I, 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 I can really play basketball. And I like another chance. And he stared at me for a long time. I think he thought that he was going to stare me out of his office. But I stood there, I just this little skinny kid, and I stood there. And he said, nobody has ever been cut from one of my basketball teams and asked me to try out again. He said, but since you got that kind of nerve, then I'm going to allow you to have another tryout. And so I tried out the next day, and he kept me on the team. In the 10th grade at high school, I was cut from the basketball team. Scott Geiler, who I saw last week, was in his office that morning, and I 
went to his office and told him that I thought he had made a mistake. <laughs> and I asked him if I could have another chance. And he said, why? And I said, because I, I think I can play basketball. And I just didn't have a good practice this week. <clears throat> and so he said those magic words, I'm going to give you one more chance because nobody has ever asked me this question before. So the next day, there was practice, and I ran out onto the court, and there were other players who were whispering, saying, Will's been cut. What's he doing out here? And, and I was practicing up a storm, shooting nice jump shots, practicing up a storm. And at the end of practice, he called everybody to the center of the court, and he said, hey, everybody, you had a great practice, great practice. And I looked to see everybody back here tomorrow at 3.30. And they all ran off to the locker room. And here I am standing right there, and I said, excuse me, coach, uh, does that mean me too? And he said, didn't I say everybody? And I was on the team. I went to Miami University. I went out for the junior varsity basketball team. <laughs> and I made it. I didn't play a lot, although I broke out of a scoring slump against Ball State and scored two points. <laughs> but I was just back on campus for homecoming. I was called down to the football field, and they had something in a box that they said was for me. And I didn't know what it was. And they opened it slowly. And it was a Miami University varsity letter jacket. I may be the most celebrated and undistinguished athlete in the history of Miami University. Uh, so, I, I just think that there's something in that. I was raised uh, with a tough grandfather. I didn't live with my own father. And, you know, it has to be something is rooted in that, I think, you know that I kept going out for the basketball team, uh, you, know, I, I, you know. And I went to Miami because a high school counselor told me that I couldn't get in. And that was an insult to me. And so before Miami had a chance to send me a rejection letter, I wrote them a letter. <laughs> I applied and didn't hear from them and I was getting nervous. And I wrote them a letter. And I was telling somebody this story not long ago. And I wrote it to the Office of Admissions. And I said, I have yet to hear from Miami University. I said, and I don't know if I'm going to be admitted or not. But I will guarantee you this, if I am admitted to Miami University, I will do something in life to make the school very proud. And so uh, I knew that people in my neighborhood who had been 
admitted to college that they would receive a big yellow packet at home. And if you didn't get in, there was a little thin letter, <laughs> you know, a little painful, thin form letter. And so uh, I came home from school uh, that spring, and, and there was a letter. And my mother was on her way out the door. She worked as a waitress. She worked in the evenings from like 6 to midnight. And she said on her way out that I had mail. And she always put my mail in the same place on top of our little small TV set. But you had to go down the hallway and then turn right and see it. And I went down the hallway and I turned right and there was a thin letter. And I must admit, my heart sank because uh, I really wanted to go to Miami University. My heart sank and I took that letter and went outside on the back stoop. And there was a train going past and I said, Dear Lord, all I want to do is get on that train, metaphorically, so I can go to college and help my mom out, you know? And I said, but here I am holding this letter, and it looks like I'm not going to be able to go to Miami University. And I remember sitting there, I was, I mean, my heart was beating. I was so afraid to open it, and I opened it, and it said, Dear Will Hager, congratulations. We would like to admit you to the Miami University class of 1976. And the next day, my big packet came. <laughs> last question over here, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hager. I uh, just would like to share. I am person that Michael was talking about. 30 years ago, I met uh, Paul and Sharon Pinnell. And uh, you are absolutely right, the way you described it. There was a, been a story floating in the water for a long time. Because 30 years ago, I started hearing these stories about Garnett and, and Bo and oh, wow. Eddie. And uh, it's, it's just, um, I, I'm blessed beyond belief to be able to, to um, share and, and, and not only hearing those stories, but meeting men with such dignity yeah. um, and the men that they've become and to share that experience with Paul and Sharon Pinnell who I met 30 years ago when I started t teaching at Columbus Public Schools. Oh, that's beautiful. But the reason I say thank you is now it's not just me being blessed, it's everybody who reads this book. And uh, you know, I, I got to experience the 68, 69 cheerleaders a few years ago still singing down to the river mm -hmm. at Briggs High School, and we were celebrating Paul's birthday. So uh, uh, the, just the, uh, the magic that uh, is out there that was floating in the water, thank you for bringing that to, uh, to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. There, uh, so uh, here is one of their famous cheers I might as well leave you with that they would always sing after their big victories. Uh, um, I went down to the river, oh yeah, and I started to drown, oh yeah, I started thinking about them tigers, oh yeah, and I came back around, oh yeah. <laughs> and then there's one more that I just love. I went, wait a minute. I went down to the railroad tracks, oh yeah. I put my big head on the track, oh yeah. I started thinking about them tigers, oh yeah. And I bought my big head back, <laughs> oh yeah. So, so the next time you're in the city, right past the high school, the mayor just honored me by naming the street at East High School Tigerland Way. Thank you.